Dr. Jaffe, this question comes in from one of our customers and he would like to know how can dysbiosis, leaky gut, lead to LPS, endotoxemia, and then lead to neuroinflammation, mitochondria degradation, and chronic pain? Well, I can take you back half a century to when Shelley Wolf, who was a mentor to many up and coming scientists, including myself, and one of his principal protégés, Dr. Ronald Eline, who remains a colleague and friend to this day, were concerned about endotoxin from the gut. And the endotoxin was a specific lipo, lipopolysaccharide. LPS is a short way of saying lipopolysaccharide. And a little bit of endotoxin that got through the mucosal wall, got into the lymphatic fluid that got into the body, was profoundly pyrogenic. It would raise the temperature of the body. It was an alert saying that foreign invaders are coming and we need to raise the temperature so that the iron goes inside the cells and can't be used by the invaders to multiply. We need to rev up the immune defense and repair system on the repair side so that we don't end up with repair deficit inflammation. We need to make flexible membranes that are not oxidized and damaged by free radical electrons that lead to weakened cells whose batteries are not able to recharge us and are not able to sustain themselves. The battery is called the mitochondria. It's a saprophyte. It came in about 2 million evolutionary years ago, 2 million evolutionary years ago, about the same time when we got fast twitch muscle fibers and lost the ability to convert glucose into ascorbate. And at that time, what we needed was more ATP energy. And the mitochondria can, can produce 36 ATPs and give them to us with protons, with acid molecules that need to be neutralized mostly by magnesium, some by potassium, and exported, that is removed from the cell so that what's called the proton gradient can be maintained so that the battery can do its job um, and not be degraded. And in addition to taking an electron and transducing it into ATP, the mitochondria does important detoxification work. And so if you don't keep the mitochondria happy in regard to enough say mitochondrial CoQ10, uh, which must be delivered in a soft gel micellized in 100% rice bran oil because of the nature of CoQ10. When you um, rehabilitate or just sustain the mitochondrial battery, the cell gets recharged. And remember that the cell needs one magnesium molecule for every ATP molecule to make the ATP work. And then it needs magnesium to activate many enzyme catalysts that make metabolism work better in the cell. So there's lots of things that magnesium does include, including working as and functioning as an antioxidant to protect essential fats when they're in lipoprotein transport. So there's lots of things that magnesium does. Now let's get back to the endotoxemia because the same people I mentioned, Shelley Wolf and Ron Eline, published in 1973 on the non-specificity of the limulus amoebocyte lysate test, because there are many things that alert the body to the need to activate that are not endotoxic. And so the, to this day, the standard test for endotoxin presence 
is the limulus lysate assay. However, going back to the early 1970s, Ronnie Lean and Shelley Wolf showed that it was a very imprecise or blunt tool. There's no easy measure for endotoxin, but when you have unexplained elevations of temperature, unexplained fevers, you can think about what we might call a leaky gut, allowing endotoxin to come in from the gut, and that gut needs to be restored to a healthy digestive transit time of 12 to 18 hours using foods that the person can digest, assimilate, and eliminate based on the LRA by ELISA Act test system. And the plan that comes with that, the essential supplements, the lifestyle uh, thinking and doing pieces, so that we become more aware of what our body needs in different seasons of our life, and living in harmony with our nature and fueling ourselves well and staying well hydrated, getting restorative sleep, walking and stretching allows us to be endotoxin free.